very disruptive innovation is RDR, or rotodynamic reactor. And it's exactly the reverse of the gas turbine. Basically, you, uh, in a gas turbine, you burn a fuel, uh, and the hot gases are cooled, and it spins the turbine. Here, you spin the turbine very fast, you put in gas at moderate temperature, 500, 600 degrees, and suddenly stop the gas flow. The temperature shoots up, so it is using the rotational energy in order to convert it to f cracking energy. And the final is the EDH, that is ethane dehydrogenation, which is like PDH, but people are still trying to figure out a catalyst which can do EDH. But what I'm saying, and this is extremely important for India, we say we want one cracker per year. Please do not invest in an old technology steam cracker. These are the crackers which in the next five years will become mainstream. And this is the technology that you have to go to because otherwise you will be emitting a lot of things and it will not be fit for net zero. Next, we go to durable polymers. And what is durable polymers? Essentially, chemical engineers beat metallurgical engineers. In other words, you have polymers which substitute metals. So we have something called engineering polymers which match the metal property and these are all material of the future. In an engineering polymer, you substitute carbon intensive metals. For example, steel consumes four times, uh, I mean, sorry, steel emits four times emissions compared to polyethylene. Uh, Aluminum emits even more. So substitute steel and aluminum with high strength weight ratio of engineering polymers. You have to bring the cost down uh, and it is already being used in EV and aerospace. Now performance uh, polymers are those which go beyond the metal property. For example, these are used for maximum durability and strength. An example is carbon fiber reinforced polymer, which are used in the wind turbine blades. I mean, you can't use aluminum, titanium in the wind turbine blades. You have to use something called CFRP. So the next thing you have to think about future is think about durable polymers. The next is recyclable. Now today, uh, there is a big problem with the plastic waste. So end of the life, unsegregated plastic waste is an eyesore and it's, it's bad. And so there is, could be mechanical recycling or chemical recycling. Now mechanical recycling has a problem because you can recycle only so many times because each recycling, there is a property and an application downgrade. Uh, we at Reliance do, do a lot of mechanical recycling, but the ultimate aim is to go for chemical recycling of plastic waste. Now, in the chemical recycling, you can either have pyrolysis in order to make a steam cracker feed, or depolymerization, that is recycled to the monomer stage, or solvent treating, I mean recycle to the polymer stage itself. Now pyrolysis, there are, there are two pyrolysis technology and this, which is extremely interesting. Now one uses supercritical water instead of fuel in order to do the pyrolysis. So that's one. There is another technology where you can recycle 
and form vapors, olefinic vapors from recycling. And so you can bypass the cracker heater furnace and go directly to the coal section and only recycle back what is not olefinic. So that's pyrolysis. Next is depolymerization. And basically, uh, for polystyrene in the world, it's now, a, a, I mean, a proven robust process that is polystyrene can be recycled to, to styrene to be used again. Now, there are catalytic processes, there are thermal processes of depolymerization or microbial process. The other is what is called solvent treating. And some of them, I mean, people call, I mean, it is used for polyester and PET, uh, the water bottles that you see on your table. Now, here it is, it goes back to the polymer stage, but it removes all the contaminants so that it can be reused. And hence, it is called also as dry cleaning of the, of the, uh, of polyester or PET. And usually you can do alcohol assess, which is using ethylene glycol as an alcohol when it is called glycolysis, or you can use methanol as an alcohol and it is called methanolysis. And but uh, in future we will also think of ionic liquid. I've covered three future of chemicals, three more remaining. The fourth is bio. Now, what uh, bamboo uh, thing is a 2G bio where you don't use food. But most of the world is still at 1G where food product is used as a biomass. If you don't use food, that is 2G, and if you use, grow your own biofeed, such as uh, grass or algae, it's called 3G. And if you don't use leaves and you do artificial photosynthesis, it's called 4G. Now, the product can be, uh, can be very good because it can be biodegradable or compostable. What's the difference? Now, when you put in the landfill, and if it, if it doesn't remain after a few months, it's biodegradable. That is, the polymer waste has degraded. If it converts to fresh soil, it's called compostable. But all in all, it eliminates plastic waste. Now, you can produce biodegradable or, or compostable product from fossil, or from a biomass. So the two examples I have given is PCL, polycaprolactone, or PBAT, which is polybutylene adipate coterethylate. This is used instead of the non-biodegradable polyester. Uh, we can also start with biofeed or biomass and that is PLA, which is the biggest biodegradable polymer in the market, 50 plus percent market share, global market share, and that is polylactic acid, and PBS, polybutylene succinate. So we can also produce what is called um, bioproducts from biomass in order to mimic PE, PP and polyester. They will not be biodegradable, but you can do it. And the way to do it from biomass, there are three routes, fermentation, pyrolysis, or gasification. And you can produce all the ethylene and propylene that you want. Four, two more to go. Transition material. Now, we talked a lot in the morning and now on innovation. There is a big energy transition going on in the world. 
And they all require materials. They all require chemicals. What are those materials? Battery materials, solar material, membranes, separators, electrolytes, and electrodes. So let's talk about electronics. In electronics, uh, the chip has to be encapsulated in something called EVA, uh, ethylene vinyl acetate, or POE, poly olefins elastomer. Display, you require a chemical called po polyfluorine. For casing, you require something called polycarbonate. And for screen, you have another chemical uh, polymer called PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. For energy, for solar PV, you require chlorosilane in order to purify um, uh, silica uh, into, into monocrystalline polysilicon, 99.9999% pure. Battery chemical, you require NMP, normal methyl pyrimidine, And for electrolytes, you require carbonates, uh, ethyl carbonate, propyl carbonates, um, diethyl carbonate, and ethyl propyl carbonate. So uh, a lot of those are used as electrolytes. Five, one more to go. And this is the real future. That is, we have been talking up to net zero. What happens after net zero? You will still require chemicals. And then you have to go to what is called e-chemicals. Now, what is e-chemicals? If you start with CO2 as a raw material and use uh, uh, renewable hydrogen, you make syngas. And the hydrogen has, of course, to be cost competitive. And this can be done by what is called a reverse water gas shift. Today we use conventional water gas shift in order to make hydrogen. Tomorrow you will have hydrogen as a feed to make syngas. And any chemical that you make from syngas will be known as e-chemicals. I mean, syngas made from CO2. And it can be methanol, it can be acetic acid, methanol derivatives, MTO, methanol to olefins, it can be cracker feed, that is E-naphtha or E-LPG, to put in the steam cracker. Also, in the case of hydrogen, there is something very exciting called turquoise hydrogen. It's still under development, but it does not produce, it is a methane pyrolysis where you don't make CO2, but you make carbon. And the carbon can be either carbon black and graphite, and this is important for epsilon because tomorrow you will make a lot of carbon black and graphite from the turquoise hydrogen process. You can make acetylene or PVC, and that all the PVC players have to be cognizant of, but this is all in the future. Or you can make C nanotubes for carbon fiber reinforced plastic. And these are the materials for tomorrow. So I am urging this, this very learned audience that you have to focus on the chemicals of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patha. I think uh, we all uh, got to learn a lot uh, from that uh, presentation. We have last few minutes on the panel. Uh, I'd like to throw it open to the audience uh, after the uh, enriching presentation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So uh, there are one or two that we can take. Sir, please.
about, we are discussing about sustainability. Now looking into green hydrogen. Okay. Now I know the Reliance has invested in a blue hydrogen. Uh, how cost effective it will be splitting water using platinum, okay? And you are talking about a huge amount of hydrogen generation. Don't you think CH4 splitting will be a much better option with a cheap catalyst like iron? We are not talking of catalyst. We are talking of energy efficiency. And you were right in the first place. Splitting water is a lot, requires a lot more energy than splitting methane. But splitting water is proven technology. Splitting methane is still in the R&D phase. And hence, we cannot talk about it till it becomes commercial. But you are absolutely right. The theoretical energy required for splitting water is 39.5 kWh yes. per kg of hydrogen. No one can make it at the theoretical efficiency. And today, the PEM electrolyzer or the alkaline electrolyzer they require between 52 and 54 kWh per kg of hydrogen. On the other hand, splitting methane, um, and it's a chemical process, it requires catalyst, but it's a chemical process. Uh, and there are lots of pyrolysis process in the world, uh, requires uh, around 10 kWh energy equivalent for splitting. So yes, if you look at energy uh, efficiency, um, I mean, there is no question that turquoise hydrogen is the way to go. Only thing is technology is unavailable. Thank you. Yep. Uh, please go ahead. Very nice presentation. I am belong to Andhra Pradesh. So there is a many mega issues are there, especially for industries, especially in petroleum sector. When the natural gas pipe leak occurs some decade backs, gas burned is one village of Konasima in our East West Godavari district. And uh, there is a, there be, the KG patient that is called natural gas from the offshore. The government called the one expert for Adam, who after taking a appropriate protection, jumped into the flame and put off the flame. Suggestions are made from then. Even now, the installed electronic sensors along with the pipeline to leak a, to detect the leakage of methane to alert the staff. Till today, there is no advanced sensor in this sector. Please elaborate for the as a layman, I am in this field. Um, actually, accidents are bad. And methane leak, methane is a fuel, and if it burns, it's bad. But more important, methane leak is even worse. Uh, forget fire, because it is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So the whole world is trying to make sure there are no methane leaks. We are trying to make sure there are no methane leaks. Methane leaking is bad, period. Forget fire. I mean, fire is worse, but methane leak itself is bad for humanity. Okay, I guess, uh, do we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. The last question, please. Uh, I'm Anil Bharadwaj, retired group general manager from ONGC. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the biorefinery. Are there any byproducts from this refinery which subsequently have some disposal problems? 
No, uh, we, we, there are co-product, um, my product from the biorefinery, like I, I mentioned, ethanol and furfural. It, as you know, ethanol is uh, in, in, we are sort of ethanol, uh, sorry, acetic, acetic acid and furfural. We are sort of acetic acid in the country. At present, uh, about 80% of the demand of acetic acid is made by, uh, through import. And only uh, producer is GNFC. And, uh, so, acetic acid is no issue. For fural, there is a slight issue when a demand is not that much. But uh, uh, if we convert into the furfural alcohol, then its demand is good. So we can con uh, do in, in that way. We can handle the furfural. And third is uh, biocoal. Biocoal is uh, very much uh, can be used for, uh, we are using for the power generation. Through, uh, for power generation. We'll fire the and generate steam. Uh, and uh, the, in that sense, uh, this power generator can be considered as a RE, RE power or green power. In fact, recently we have um, uh, signed a MOU with NTPC, who is also going to set up the similar type of uh, biorefinery in the western Nisam, uh, west part of the Assam, uh, a place called uh, Salakati. So there also they can utilize uh, this uh, bio coal from the bio refinery for making their uh, electricity greener. So I th I don't think there's a, there is any issue for any byproduct. What about the lignin which you separate out? Yeah, lignin uh, 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 lignin uh, it also goes with the bio coal. So lignin uh, 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 is converted into the uh, bio coal ultimately. So, it can uh, be used as a fuel. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Andhra was asking about that fire in Amlapuram. Uh, I can tell you more details about this because I did a lot of study on that.